Chapter One of the Gold of Fairney Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Gold of Fairney Lee by Andrew Lang. Chapter One The Old House. You may still see the old Scotch house where Randall was born so long ago. Nobody lives there now. Most of the roof has fallen in. There's no glass in the windows, and all the doors are open. They were open in the days of Randall's father. Nearly four hundred years have passed since then. And every one who came was welcome to share his beef and broth and ale. But now the doors are not only open, they are quite gone, and there is nobody within to give you a welcome. So there is nothing but emptiness in the old house where Randall lived with Jean, three hundred and sixty years or so before you were born. It is a high old house and wide, with the broken slates still on the roof. At the corner there are little round towers, like pepper boxes, with sharp peaks. The stems of the ivy that covers the walls are as thick as trees. There are many trees crowding all round, and there are hills round it too, and far below you hear the tweed whispering all day. The house is called Fairney Lee, which means the fairy's field, for people believed in fairies, as you shall hear, when Randall was a boy, and even when my father was a boy. Randall was all alone in the house when he was a little fellow, along with his mother and Nancy, the old nurse, and Simon Grieve, the butler, who wore a black velvet coat and a big silver chain. Then there were the maids and the grooms and the farm folk, who were all friends of Randall's. He was not lonely, and he did not feel unhappy, even before Jean came, as you shall be told. But the grown-up people were sad and silent at Fairney Lee. Randall had no father. His mother, Lady Kerr, was a widow. She was still quite young and Randall thought her the most beautiful person in the world. Children think these things about their mothers, and Randall had seen no ladies but his mother only. She had brown hair and brown eyes and red lips, and a grave, kind face, which looked serious under her great white widow's cap, and the black hood over it. Randall never saw his mother cry, but when he was a very little child indeed, he had heard her crying in the night. This was after his father went away. Chapter 2 How Randall's Father Came Home Randall remembered his father going to fight the English, and how he came back again. It was a windy August evening when he went away. The rain had fallen since morning. Randall had watched the white mists, driven by the gale, down through the black pine wood that covers the hill opposite Fairney Lee. The mist looked like armies of ghosts, he thought, marching, marching through the pines, with their white flags flying and streaming. Then the sun came out red at evening, and Randall's father rode away with all his men. He had a helmet on his head, and a great axe hanging from his neck by a chain, and a spear in his hand. He was riding his big horse, Sir Hugh, and he caught Randall up to the saddle and kissed him many times before he clattered out of the courtyard. All the tenants and men about the farm rode with him, all with spears, and a flag embroidered with a crest in gold. His mother watched them from the tower 
till they were out of sight, and Randall saw them ride away, not on hard, smooth roads like ours, but along a green, grassy track, the water splashing up to their stirrups where they crossed the marshes. Then the sky turned as red as blood in the sunset, and next it grew brown like the rust on a sword, and the tweed below, when they rode the ford, was all red and gold and brown. Then time went on. That seemed a long time to Randall. Only the women were left in the house, and Randall played with the shepherd's children. They sailed boats in the mill pond, and they went down to the boat pool and watched to see the big copper-colored salmon splashing in the still water. One evening Randall looked up suddenly from his play. It was growing dark. He had been building a house with the round stones and wet sand by the river. He looked up and there was his own father. He was riding all alone, and his horse, Sir Hugh, was very lean and lame, and scarred with the spurs. The spear in his father's hand was broken, and he had no sword, and he looked neither to right nor to left. His eyes were wide open, but he seemed to see nothing. Randall cried out to him, Father! Father! But he never glanced at Randall. He did not look as if he heard him or knew he was there, and suddenly he seemed to go away. Randall did not know how or where. Randall was frightened. He ran into the house and went to his mother. Oh, mother, he said, I have seen father. He was riding all alone and he would not look at me. Sir Hugh was lame. Where has he gone? said Lady Kerr in a strange voice. He went away out of sight, said Randall. I could not see where he went. Then his mother told him it could not be that his father would not have come back alone. He would not leave his men behind him in the war. But Randall was so sure that she did not scold him. She knew he believed what he said. He saw that she was not happy. All that night, which was the 4th of September, the year 1513, the day of Flodden fight, Randall's mother did not go to bed. She kept moving about the house. Now she would look from the tower window up Tweed. And now she would go along the gallery and look down Tweed from the other tower. She had lights burning in all the windows. All next day she was never still. She climbed, with two of her maids, to the top of the hill above Yare, and she watched the roads down Ettrick and Yarrow. Next night she slept little and rose early. About noon Randall saw three or four men riding wearily with tired horses. They could scarcely cross the ford of Tweed. The horses were so tired. The men were Simon Grieve the butler and some of the tenants. They looked very pale. Some of them had their heads tied up, and there was blood on their faces. Lady Kerr and Randall ran to meet them. Simon Grieve lighted from his horse and whispered to Randall's mother. Randall did not hear what he said, but his mother cried, I knew it, I knew it, and turned quite white. Where is he? she said. Simon pointed across the hill. They're bringing a corp, he said. Randall knew the corp meant the dead body. He began to cry. Where's my father? he said. Where's my father? His mother led him into the house. She gave him to the old nurse. 
who cried over him and kissed him and offered him cakes and made him a whistle with a branch of plane tree. So in a short while Randall only felt puzzled. Then he forgot and began to play. He was a very little boy. Lady Kerr shut herself up in her own room, her bower, the servants called it. Soon Randall heard heavy steps on the stairs and whispering. He wanted to run out, and his nurse caught hold of him and would not let him go. But he slipped out of her hand and looked over the staircase. They were bringing up the body of a man stretched on a shield. It was Randall's father. He had been slain at Flodden, fighting for the king. An arrow had gone through his brain, and he had fallen beside James the Fourth, with many another brave knight, all the best of Scotland, the flowers of the forest. What was it Randall saw when he thought he met his father in the twilight three days before? He never knew. His mother said, he must have dreamed it all. The old nurse used to gossip about it to the maids. He's an Uncle Bairn, Randall. I wish he may nae be fay. She meant that Randall was a strange child, and that strange things would happen to him. Chapter 3 How Jean Was Brought to Fairnilee the winter went by very sadly. At first the people about Fernilee expected the English to cross the border and march against them. They drove their cattle out on the wild hills and into marshes where only they knew the firm paths, and raised walls of earth and stones, barmkins they call them, round the old house and made many arrows to shoot out of the narrow windows at the English. Randall used to like to see the arrow-making beside the fire at night. He was not afraid, and said he would show the English what he could do with his little bow. But weeks went on, and no enemy came. Spring drew near, the snow melted from the hills. One night Randall was awakened by a great noise of shouting. He looked out of the window and saw bright torches moving about. He heard the cows routing or bellowing and the women screaming. He thought the English had come. So they had, not the English army, but some robbers from the other side of the border. At that time, the people on the south side of Scotland and the north side of England used to steal each other's cows time about. When a Scotch squire or laird, like Randall's father, had been robbed by the neighboring English, he would wait his chance and drive away cattle from the English side. This time most of Randall's mother's herds were seized by a sudden attack in the night and were driven away through the forest to England. Two or three of Lady Kerr's men were hurt by the English, but old Simon Grieve took a prisoner. He did this in a curious way. He shot an arrow after the robbers as they rode off, and the arrow pinned an Englishman's leg to the saddle, and even into his horse. The horse was hurt and frightened, and ran away, right back to Fairney Lee, where it was caught, with the rider and all, for of course he could not dismount. They treated him kindly at Fairney Lee, though they laughed at him a good deal. They found out from him where the English had come from. He did not mind telling them, for he was really a gypsy from Yetholm, where the gypsies live and Scott and Southron was all one to him. When old Simon Grieve knew who the people were who had taken the cows, he was not long in calling the men together and trying to get back what he had lost. Early one April morning, a gray morning, 
with snow in the air. He and his spearmen set out, riding down through the forest, and so into Liddisdale. When they came back again, there were great rejoicings at Fairnilee. They drove most of their own cows before them, and a great many other cows that they had not lost, cows of the English farmers. The byres and yards were soon full of cattle, lowing and roaring very uneasy, and some of them with marks of the spears that had goaded them across many a ford, and up many a rocky pass in the hills. Randall jumped downstairs to the great hall where his mother sat. Simon Grieve was telling her all about it. We drove our own cattle home, and some others that were not ours. And we took all the goods out of the hall at hard riding, and a pretty load of tapestries and rugs, and other things we have to show for our ride. Then he called to some of his men who came into the hall, and cast down great piles of all sorts of spoil and booty silver plate, and silken hangings, and a heap of rugs, and carpets, and plaids, such as Randall had never seen before, for the English were much richer than the Scotch. Randall threw himself on the pile of rugs, and began to roll on it. "'Oh, mother!' he cried suddenly, jumping up and looking with wide open eyes. There's something living in the heap. Perhaps it's a donkey or a rabbit or a kitten. Then Randall tugged at the cloths, and then they all heard a little shrill cry. Why, it's a bairn, said Lady Kerr, who had sat very grave all the time, pleased to have done the English some harm, for they had killed her husband and were all her deadly foes. It's a bairn, she cried, and pulled out of the great heap of cloaks and rugs a little beautiful child in its white nightdress with its yellow curls all tangled over its blue eyes. Then Lady Kerr and the old nurse could not make too much of the pretty English child that had come here in such a wonderful way. How did it get mixed up with all the spoil? And how had it been carried so far on horseback without being hurt? Nobody ever knew. It came as if the fairies had sent it. English it was, but the best Scot could not hate such a pretty child. Old Nancy Dryden, ran up to the old nursery with it, and laid it in a great wooden tub full of hot water, and was giving it warm milk to drink and dandling it, almost before the men knew what had happened. "'Yon bairn will be a bonny mate for you, Master Randall,' said old Simon Grieve. "'Deed, I dinna think her kin will come spearin' after her fairny lee.' The red cock's crawn o'er her riding ha this day, and when the women folk come back free to wood, they'll hae other thing to do for by looking for bairns. When Simon Greaves said that the red cock was crowing over his enemy's home, he meant that he had set it on fire after the people who lived in it had run away. Lady Kerr grew pale when she heard what he said. She hated the English, to be sure, but she was a woman with a kind heart. She thought of the dreadful danger that the little English girl had escaped, and she went upstairs and helped the nurse to make the child happy. Thanks. Chapter 4 Randall and Jean The little girl soon made everyone at Fairney Lee happy. She was far too young to remember her own home, and presently she was crawling up and down the long hall and making friends with Randall. 
they found out that her name was Jane Musgrave, though she could hardly say Musgrave, and they called her Jean with their Scotch tongues, or Jean o the Kai, because she came when the cows were driven home again. Soon the old nurse came to like her near as well as Randall, her ain bairn, her own child, as she called him. In the summer days, Jean, as she grew older, would follow Randall about like a little doggie. They went fishing together, and Randall would pull the trout out of Cadden Burn, or the Burn of Peel, and Jeanie would be very proud of him, and very much alarmed at the big, wide jaws of the yellow trout. And Randall would plait helmets with green rushes for her and him and make spears of bulrushes, and play at tilts and tournaments. There was peace in the country, or if there was war, it did not come near the quiet valley of the Tweed, and the hills that lie round Fairney Lee. In summer they were always on the hills and by the burnsides. You cannot think, if you have not tried, what pleasant company a burn is. It comes out of the deep black wells in the moss, far away on the tops of the hills where the sheep feed, and the fox peers from his hole, and the ravens build in the crags. The burn flows down from the lonely places, cutting away between steep green banks tumbling in white waterfalls over rocks and lying in black deep pools below the waterfalls. At every turn it does something new and plays a fresh game with its brown waters. The white pebbles in the water look like gold. Often Randall would pick one out and think he had found a gold mine till he got it into the sunshine, and then it was only a white stone, what he called a chucky stain. But he kept hoping for better luck next time. In the height of summer, when the streams were very low, he and the shepherd's boys would build dams of stones and turf across a narrow part of the burn, while Jean sat and watched them on a little round knoll. Then, when plenty of water had collected in the pool, they would break the dam and let it all run downhill in a little flood. They called it a hurly gush. And in winter, they would slide on the black, smooth ice of the boat pool beneath the branches of the alders. Or they would go out with Yarrow, the shepherd's dog, and follow the track of wild creatures in the snow. The rabbit makes marks like two stars, and the hare makes marks like two stars. But the fox's track is just as if you had pushed a piece of wood through the snow, a number of cuts in the surface going straight along. When it was very cold, the grouse and blackcocks would come into the trees near the house, and Randall and Jean would put out porridge for them to eat, and the great white swans floated in from the frozen locks on the hills, and gathered round open reaches and streams of the Tweed. It was pleasant to be a boy, then, in the north. And at Halloween they would duck for apples in tubs of water and burn nuts in the fire and look for the shadow of the lady Randall was to marry in the mirror, but he only saw Jean looking over his shoulder. The days were very short in winter so far north, and they would soon be driven into the house. Then they sat by the nursery fire, and those were almost the pleasantest hours for the old nurse would tell them old Scotch stories of elves and fairies and sing them old songs. 
Jean would crawl close to Randall and hold his hand for fear the Red Eton or some other awful boogie should get her. And in the dancing shadows of the firelight, she would think she saw Whoopity Story, the wicked old witch with the spinning wheel. But it was really nothing but the shadow of the wheel that the old nurse drove with her foot. Brrr, brrr, and that word and rattled as she span and told her tale. For people span their cloth at home then, instead of buying it from shops. And the old nurse was a great woman for spinning. She was a great woman for stories, too, and believed in fairies and boggles, as she called them. Had not her own cousin, Andrew Tamson, passed the call shields lock one New Year morning? And had he not heard a dreadful roaring, as if all the cattle on Faldenside Hill were routing at once? And then did he not see a great black beast roll down the hillside like a black ball and run into the lock? which grew white with foam, and the waves leaped up the banks like a tide rising. What could that be except the Kelpie that lives in Colchiel's Lock, and is just a muckle big water bull? And what for should there no be water kai, if there's land kai? Randall and Jean thought it was very likely there were kai or cattle in the water, and some highland people think so still, and believe they have seen the great Kelpie come roaring out of the lake, or shelly coat, whose skin is all crusted like a rock with shells sitting beside the sea. The old nurse had other tales that nobody believes any longer about brownies. A brownie was a very useful creature to have in a house. He was a kind of fairy man, and he came out in the dark when everybody had gone to bed, just as mice pop out at night. He never did any one any harm. But he sat and warmed himself at the kitchen fire. If any work was unfinished, he did it, and made everything tidy that was left out of order. It is a pity there are no such boggles now. If anybody offered the brownie any payment, even if it was only a silver penny or a new coat, he would take offense and go away. Other stories the old nurse had about hidden treasures and buried gold. If you believed her, there was hardly an old stone on the hillside but had gold under it. The very sheep that fed upon the isled and hills, which Randall knew well, had yellow teeth, because there was so much gold under the grass. Randall had taken two scones, or rolls, in his pocket for dinner, and ridden over to the isled and hills. He had seen a rainbow touch one of them, and there he hoped he would find the treasure that always lies at the tail of the rainbow but he got very soon tired of digging for it with his little dirk or dagger. It blunted the dagger, and he found nothing. Perhaps he had not marked quite the right place, he thought. But he looked at the teeth of the sheep, and they were yellow, so he had no doubt that there was a gold mine under the grass, if he could find it. The old nurse knew that it was very difficult to dig up fairy gold. Generally something happened just when people heard their pickaxes clink on the iron pot that held the treasure. A dreadful storm of thunder and lightning would break out, or the burn would be flooded and rush down, all red and roaring, sweeping away the tools and drowning the digger. Or a strange man that nobody had ever seen before would come up waving his arms and crying out that the castle was on fire. Then the people would hurry up to the castle and find that it was not on fire at all. When they returned, 
all the earth would be just as it was before they began, and they would give up in despair. Nobody could ever see the man again that gave the alarm. Who could he be, nurse? Randall asked. Just one of the good folk, I'm thinking. But it's no wheel to be speaking of them. Randall knew that the good folk meant the fairies. The old nurse called them the good folk for fear of offending them. She would not speak much about them, except now and then, when the servants had been making merry. And is there any treasure hidden near Fairney Lee, nursey? asked little Jean. Treasure, my bonny doll. Mare than all the men about the toon could carry away frae morning till nicht. Do ye no kin the owl rhyme? Atween the wet ground and the dry, the gold of Fairney Lee doth lie. And there's the other owl rhyme. Between the camp o' rink and tweed water clear, lie nine king's ransoms for nine hundred year. Randall and Jean were very glad to hear so much gold was near them as they would pay nine king's ransoms. They took their small spades and dug little holes in the camp of Rink, which is a great old circle of stonework surrounded by a deep ditch on the top of a hill above the house. But Jean was not a very good digger, and even Randall grew tired. They thought that they would wait till they grew bigger, and then find the gold. Chapter 5 The Good Folk Everybody knows there's fairies, said the old nurse one night, when she was bolder than usual. What she said we will put in English, not Scotch, as she spoke it, but they do not like to be called fairies. So the old rhyme runs, if ye call me imp or elf, I warn you, look well to yourself. If ye call me fairy, ye'll find me quite contrary. If good neighbor you call me, then good neighbor I will be. But if you call me kindly sprite, I'll be your friend both day and night. So you must always call them good neighbors or good folk when you speak of them. Did you ever see a fairy, nurse? asked Randall. Not myself, but my mother knew a woman. They called her Tibby Dixon, and her husband was a shepherd. And she had a bairn, as bonny a bairn as you ever saw. And one day she went to the well to draw water. And as she was coming back, she heard a loud scream in her house. Then her heart leaped, and fast she ran and flew to the cradle, and there she saw an awful sight, not her own bairn, but a withered imp, with hands like a mole's, and a face like a frog's, and a mouth from ear to ear, and two great staring eyes. What was it? asked Jeanie in a trembling voice. A fairy's bairn that had not thriven, said nurse, and when their bairns do not thrive, they just steal honest folks' children and carry them away to their own country. And where's that? said Randall. It's under the ground, said Nurse. And there they have gold and silver and diamonds. And there's the queen of them all that's as beautiful as the day. She has yellow hair down to her feet, and she has blue eyes like the sky on a fine day, and her voice like all the Mavis is singing in the spring. And she is I dressed in green, and all her court in green, and she rides a white horse with golden bells on the bridle. I'd like to go there and see her, said Randall. Oh, never say that, my bairn. You may never know who may hear you. And if you go there, how will you come back again? And what will your mother do? And Jean here, and me that's carried you many a time in weary arms when you were a babe. Can't people come back again? asked Randall. Some say yes, and some say no. There was Tarn Hislop that vanished away 
the day before all the lads and your father went forth to that weary war of Flodden, and the English for once by guile won the day. While Tam Hislop, when the news came that all must arm and mount and ride, he could nowhere be found. It was as if the wind had carried him away. High and low they saw him, but there was his clothes and his jack and his sword and his spear, but no Tam Hislop. Well, no man heard more of him for seven whole years, not till last year. And then he came back, sore tired he looked, I, and older than when he was lost. And I met him by the well, and I was frightened. And Tam, I said, where have ye been this weary time? I've been with them, that I will not speak the name of, says he. Ye mean the good folk? said I. Ye have said it, says he. Then I went up to the house with my heart in my mouth, and I met Simon Grieve. Simon, I says, here's Tam Hislop come home from the good folk. I'll soon send him back to them, says he, and he takes a great rung and lays it about Tam's shoulders, calling him Coward Loon, that ran away from the fighting. And since then Tam has never been seen about the place. But the laird's men of Gala knows them that say he was in Perth the last seven years and not in Fairyland at all. But it was Fairyland, he told me, and he would not lie to his mother's half-brother's cousin. Randall did not care much for the story of Tam Hislop. A fellow who would let old Simon Grieve beat him could not be worthy of the fairy queen. Randall was about thirteen now, a tall boy with dark eyes, black hair, a brown face with the red on his cheeks. He had grown up in a country where everything was magical and haunted, where fairy knights rode on the leas after dark and challenged men to battle. Every castle had its tale of Red Cap, the sly spirit, or of the woman of the hairy hand. Every old mound was thought to cover hidden gold. And all was so lonely, the green hills rolling between river and river, with no men on them, nothing but sheep and grouse and plover. No wonder that Randall lived in a kind of dream. He would lie and watch the long grass till it looked like a forest and he thought he could see elves dancing between the green grass stems that were like fairy trees. He kept wishing that he too might meet the fairy queen and be taken into that other world where everything was beautiful. Chapter 6 The Wishing Well Jean, said Randall one midsummer morning, I'm going to the wishing well. Oh, Randall, said Jean, it's so far away. I can walk it, said Randall, and you must come too. I want you, Jean. It's not very far. But Mother says it's wrong to go to wishing wells, Jean answered. Why is it wrong, said Randall, switching at the tall fox gloves with a stick? Oh, she says it's a wicked thing and forbidden by the church. People who go to wish there sacrifice to the spirits of the well. And Father Francis told her it was very wrong. Father Francis is a shaveling, said Randall. I heard Simon Grieve say so. What's a shaveling, Randall? I don't know. A man that does not fight, I think. I don't care what a shaveling says. So, I mean just to go and wish, and I won't sacrifice anything. There can't be any harm in that. But, oh, Randall, you've got your green doublet on. Well, why not? Do you not know it angers the fair, I mean, the good folk, that anyone should wear green on the hill but themselves? I cannot help it, said Randall. If I go in and change my doublet, they will ask what I do that for. I'll chance it, green or gray, and wish my wish for all that. And what are you going to wish? I'm going to wish to meet the fairy queen, 
Just think how beautiful she must be, dressed all in green, with gold bells on her bridle, and riding a white horse, shod with gold. I think I see her galloping through the woods and out across the hill, over the heather. But you will go away with her and never see me any more, said Jean. No, I won't. Or if I do, I'll come back with such a horse and a sword with a gold handle. I'm going to the wishing well. Come on. Jean did not like to say no, and off they went. Randall and Jean started without taking anything with them to eat. They were afraid to go back to the house for food. Randall said they would be sure to find something somewhere. The wishing well was on the top of a hill between Yarrow and Tweed, so they took off their shoes and waded the Tweed at the shallowest part, and then they walked up the green grassy bank on the other side, till they came to the burn of Peel. Here they passed the old square tower of Peel, and the shepherd dogs came out and barked at them. Randall threw a stone at them, and they ran away with their tails between their legs. Don't you think we had better go into Peel and get some bannocks to eat on the way, Randall? said Jean. But Randall said he was not hungry, and besides the people at Peel would tell the Fairney Lee people where they had gone. We'll wish for things to eat when we get to the wishing well, said Randall. All sorts of good things, cold venison, pasty, and everything you like. So they began climbing the hill, and they followed the Peel burn. It ran in and out, winding this way and that, and when they did get to the top of the hill, Jean was very tired and very hungry, and she was very disappointed, for she expected to see some wonderful new country at her feet, and there was only a low strip of sunburnt grass and heather, and then another hilltop. So Jean sat down, and the hot sun blazed on her, and the flies buzzed about her, and tormented her. Come on, Jean, said Randall. It must be over the next hill. So poor Jean got up and followed him. But he walked far too fast for her. When she reached the crest of the next hill, she found a great cairn, or pile of grey stones, and beneath her lay far, far below a deep valley covered with woods and a stream running through it that she had never seen before. That stream was the Yarrow. Randall was nowhere in sight, and she did not know where to look for the wishing well. If she had walked straight forward through the trees, she would have come to it. But she was so tired, and so hungry, and so hot, that she sat down at the foot of the cairn and cried as if her heart would break. Then she fell asleep. When Jean woke, it was as dark as it ever is on a midsummer night in Scotland. It was a soft, cloudy night, not a clear night, with a silver sky. Jeanie heard a loud roaring close to her, and the red light of a great fire was in her sleepy eyes. In the firelight she saw strange black beasts with horns plunging and leaping and bellowing, and dark figures rushing around the flames. It was the beasts that made the roaring. They were bounding about close to the fire, and sometimes in it, and were all mixed in the smoke. Jeanie was dreadfully frightened, too frightened to scream. Presently she heard the voices of men shouting on the hill below her. The shouts and the barking of dogs came nearer and nearer. Then a dog ran up to her and licked her face, and jumped about her. It was her own sheepdog, Yarrow. He ran back to the men who were following him, and came again with one of them. It was old Simon Grieve, very tired, and so much out of breath that he could scarcely speak. Jean was very glad to see him, and not frightened any longer. "'Oh, Jeanie mud do said Simon. "'Where ha' ye been? A muckle gleef ye ha gain us, and a weary spiel up the weary breeze. Jean told him all about it, how she had come with Randall to see the wishing well, and how she had lost him and fallen asleep. 
and sick a nick for you bairns to wander on the hill said simon it's the nick to st john when the geed folk he power and there's a the lads burning the bell fires and driving the nout through them nay less will serve them sick a nick this was the cause of the fire jean saw and of the noise of the cattle on midsummer's night the country folk used to light these fires and drive the cattle through them it was an old old custom come down from heathen times now the other men from fairneedley had gathered round jean lady kerr had sent them out to look for randall and her on the hills they had heard from the good wife at peel that the children had got up the burn and yarrow had tracked them till jean was found chapter seven where is randall jean was found but where was randall she told the men who had come out to look for her that randall had gone on to look for the wishing well so they rolled her up in a big shepherd's plaid and two of them carried jean home in the plaid while all the rest with lighted torches in their hands went to look for randall through the wood jean was so tired that she fell asleep again in her plaid before they reached fairney lee she was wakened by the men shouting as they drew near the house to show that they were coming home lady kerr was waiting at the gate and the old nurse ran down the grassy path to meet them where's my bairn she cried as soon as she was within call the men said here's mistress jean and randall will be here soon they've gone to look for him where are they looking cried nurse just about the wishing well the nurse gave a scream and hobbled back to lady kerr my bairn's tint she cried my bairn's tint they'll find him never the good folk have stolen him away from that weary wishing well hush nurse said lady kerr do not frighten jean she spoke to the men who had no doubt that randall would soon be found and brought home so jean was put to bed where she forgot all her troubles and lady kerr waited waited all night till the gray light began to come in about two in the morning lady kerr kept very still and quiet telling her beads and praying but the old nurse would never be still but was always wandering about down to the river's edge listening for the shouts of the shepherds coming home and then she would come back again and moan and wring her hands crying for her bairn about six o'clock when it was broad daylight and all the birds were singing the men returned from the hill but randall did not come with them then the old nurse set up a great cry as the country people do over the bed of someone who has just died lady kerr sent her away and called simon grieve to her own room you have not found the boy yet she said very stately and pale he must have wandered over into yarrow perhaps he's gone as far as newark and pass the night at the castle or with the shepherd at foulshields no my lady said simon grieve some o the men went over to newark and some to foulshields and other some down to sir john murray's at philippa but there's never a word or randall in all the countryside did you find no trace of him said lady kerr sitting down suddenly in a great armchair we went first through the wood my lady by the path to the wishing well and he had been there for the whip he carried in his hand was lying on the grass and we found this he put his hand in his pouch and brought out a little silver crucifix that randall used always to carry around his neck on a chain this was lying on the grass beside the wishing well, my lady. Then he stopped, for Lady Kerr had swooned away. She was worn out with watching and with anxiety about Randall. Simon went and called the maids, 
and they brought water and wine, and soon Lady Kerr came back to herself with the little silver crucifix in her hand. The old nurse was crying and making a great noise. The good folk have taken my bairn, she said. This nicked, oh, all the nicks o' the year, when the fairy folk preserve us frae them have power. But they could nay take the blessed rood of grace. It was beyond their strength. If gypsies or robber folk frae the debatable land had carried away the bairn, they would ha' taken him cross and awe. But the geed folks had gotten him, and Randall Kerr will never, never mare come him to bonny fairy Lee. What the old nurse said was what everybody thought. Even Simon Grieve shook his head and did not like it. But Lady Kerr did not give up hope. She sent horsemen through all the countryside, up Tweed to the Crook, and to Tala, up Yarrow, past Catslack Tower, and on to the Lock of St. Mary, up Ettrick, to Thurlistane, and Bukeley, and over to Gala, and to Braxholm, in Tiviotdale, and even to Hermitage Castle, far away in Lytle Water. They rode far and rode fast, and at every cottage and every tower they asked, had any one seen a boy in green? But nobody had seen Randall through all the countryside. Only a shepherd lad on Falshiel's Hill had heard bells ringing in the night and a sound of laughter go past him, like a breeze of wind over the heather. Days went by, and all the country was out to look for Randall. Down in Yetholm they sought him among the gypsies and across the Eden to Mary Carlisle, and through the land debatable, where the robber Armstrongs and Grahams lived, and far down Tweed, past Melrose, and up Jed Water, far into the Cheviot Hills. But there never came any word of Randall. He had vanished, as if the earth had opened and swallowed him. Father Francis came from Melrose Abbey and prayed with Lady Kerr, and gave her all the comfort he could. He shook his head when he heard of the wishing well, but he said that no spirit of earth or air could have power forever over a Christian soul. But even when he spoke, he remembered that once in seven years the fairy folk have to pay a dreadful tax, one of themselves to the king of a terrible country of darkness. And what if they had stolen Randall to pay the tax with him? This was what troubled good Father Francis, though like a wise man he said nothing about it and even put the thought away out of his own mind. But you may be sure that the old nurse had thought of this tax on the fairies too, and that she did not hold her peace about it, but spoke to every one that would listen to her, and would have spoken to the mistress if she had been allowed. But when she tried to begin, Lady Kerr told her that she had to put her own trust in heaven and in the saints, and she gave the nurse such a look when she said that if ever Jean heard of this, she would send nurse away from Fairney Lee, out of the country, that the old woman was afraid, and was quiet. As for poor Jean, she was perhaps the most unhappy of them all. She thought to herself, if she had refused to go with Randall to the wishing well, and had run in and told Lady Kerr, then Randall would never have started to find the wishing well, and she put herself in great danger, as she fancied to find him. She wandered alone on the hills, seeking all the places that were believed to be haunted by fairies. At every fairy now, as the country folk called the little green knolls in the middle of the heather, Jean would stoop her ear to the ground, trying to hear the voices of the fairies within, for it was believed that you might hear the sound of their speech and the trampling of their horses and the shouts of the fairy children. But no sound came. 
except the song of the burn flowing by, and the hum of gnats in the air, and the gock cock, the cry of the grouse, when you frighten him in the heather. Then Jeanie would try another way of meeting the fairies and finding Randall. She would walk nine times around a fairy now, beginning from the left side, because then it was fancied that the hillside would open like a door and show a path into fairyland. But the hillside never opened, and she never saw a single fairy, not even old whoopity story, sit with her spinning wheel in a green glen, spinning grass into gold, and singing her fairy song. I once was young and fair, my eyes were bright and blue, as if the sun shone through and golden was my hair. Down to my feet it rolled, ruddy and ripe like corn, upon an autumn morn in heavy waves of gold. Now am I gray and old, and so I sit and spin, with trembling hand and thin, this metal bright and cold. I would give all the gain these heaps of wealth untold, of hard and glittering gold, could I be young again. Lang, Chapter 8 The Ill Years so autumn came, and all the hillsides were golden with the heather, and the red coral berries of the rowan trees hung from the boughs, and were wet with the spray of the waterfalls in the burns. And days grew shorter, and winter came with snow, but Randall never came back to Fernie Lee. Season after season passed, and year after year, Lady Kerr's hair grew white like snow, and her face thin and pale, for she fasted often, as was the rule of her church. All this was before the Reformation, and she slept little, praying half the night for Randall's sake, and she went on pilgrimages to many shrines of the saints, to St. Boswell and St. Rule's, hard by the great cathedral of St. Andrews on the sea. Nay, she went across the border as far as the abbey of St. Albans, and even to St. Thomas's shrine of Canterbury, taking Jean with her. Many a weary mile they rode over hill and dale, and many an adventure they had, and ran many dangers from robbers, and soldiers disbanded from the wars. But at last they had to come back to Fernie Lee, and a sad place it was, and silent without the sound of Randall's voice in the hall, and the noise of his hunting horn in the woods. None of the people wore mourning for him, though they mourned in their hearts, for to put on black would look as if they had given up all hope. Perhaps most of them thought they would never see him again, but Jeanie was not one who despaired. The years that had turned Lady Kerr's hair white made Jean a tall, slim lass, very bonny, everyone said, and the country folk called her the Flower of Tweed. The Yarrow folk had their Flower of Yarrow, and why not the folk of Tweedside? It was now six years since Randall had been lost, and Jeanie was grown a young woman, about seventeen years old. She had always kept a hope that if Randall was with the Fairy Queen, he would return, perhaps, in the seventh year. People said, on the countryside, that many a man and woman had escaped out of Fairyland after seven years' imprisonment there. Now the sixth year since Randall's disappearance began very badly, and got worse as it went on, just when spring should have been beginning. In the end of February, there came the most dreadful snowstorm, 
It blew and snowed and blew again, and the snow was as fine as the dust on the road in summer. The strongest shepherds could not hold their own against the tempest, and were smored or smothered in the waste. The flocks moved down from the hillsides, down and down, till all the sheep on the farm would be gathered together in a crowd, under the shelter of a wood in some deep dip of the hills. The storm seemed as if it would never cease. For thirteen days the snow drifted and the wind blew. There was nothing for the sheep to eat, and if there had been hay enough, it would have been impossible to carry it to them. The poor beasts bit on the wool of each other's backs, and so many of them died that the shepherds built walls with the dead bodies to keep the wind and snow away from those that were left alive. There could be little work done on the farm that spring, and summer came in so cold and wet that the corn could not ripen, but was leveled to the ground. Then autumn was rainy, and the green sheaves lay out in the fields and sprouted and rotted, so that little corn was reaped, and little flour could be made that year. Then in winter, and as spring came on, the people began to starve. They had no grain, and there were no potatoes in those days, and no rice, nor could corn be brought in from foreign countries. So men and women and children might be seen in the fields with white pinched faces gathering nettles to make soup and digging for roots that were often little better than poison. They ground the bark of the fir trees and mixed it with the little flour they could get, and they ate such beasts as never are eaten except in time of famine. It is said that one very poor woman and her daughter always looked healthy and plump in these dreadful times, till people began to suspect them of being witches, and they were taken and charged before the sheriff with living by witchcraft, and very likely they would have been burned. So they confessed that they had fed ever since the famine began on snails, but there were not snails enough for all the countryside even if people had cared to eat them. So many men and women died, and more were very weak and ill. Lady Kerr spent all her money in buying food for her people. Jean and she lived on as little as they could, and were as careful as they could be. They sold all the beautiful silver plate except the cup that Randall's father used to drink out of long ago but almost everything else was sold to buy corn. So the weary year went on, and the midsummer night came round, the seventh since the night when Randall was lost. Then Jean did what she had always meant to do. In the afternoon she slipped out of the house of Fairney Lee, taking a little bread in a basket, and saying that she would go to see the farmer's wife at Peel which was on the other side of Tweed, but her mind was to go to the wishing well. There she would wish for Randall back again to help his mother in the evil times. And if she too passed away, as he had passed out of sight and hearing, then at least she might meet him in that land where he had been carried. How strange it seemed to Jean to be doing everything over again that she had done seven years before. Then she had been a little girl, and it had been hard work for her to climb up the side of the Peel Burn. Now she walked lightly and quickly, for she was tall and well-grown. Soon she reached the crest of the first hill and remembered how she had sat down there and cried when she was a child, and how the flies had tormented her. They were buzzing and teasing still for good times or bad make no difference to them, as long as the sun shines. Then she reached the cairn at the top of the next hill, and far below her lay the forest, and deep within it ran yarrow, glittering like silver. Jean paused a few moments, and then 
struck into the green path which led through the wood. The path wound beneath dark pines. Their topmost branches were red in the evening light, but the shade was black beneath them. Soon the path reached a little grassy glade, and there among cold, wet grasses was the wishing well. It was almost hidden by the grass, and it looked very black and cool and deep. A tiny trickle of water flowed out of it, flowed it down to join the yarrow. The trees about it had scraps of rags and other things pinned to them, offerings made by the country people to the spirits of the well. Chapter 9 The White Roses Jeanie sat down beside the well. She wished her three wishes to see Randall, to win him back from Fairyland, and to help the people in the famine. Then she knelt on the grass and looked down into the well water. At first she saw nothing but the smooth black water, with little waves trembling in it. Then the water began to grow bright within, as if the sun was shining far, far below. Then it grew as clear as crystal, and she saw through it like a glass into a new country, a beautiful country, with a wide green plain, and in the midst of the plain a great castle, with golden flags floating from the tops of all the towers. Then she heard a curious whispering noise that thrilled and murmured, as if the music of all the trees that the wind blows through the world were in her ears, as if the noise of all the waves of every sea, and the rustling of heather bells on every hill, and the singing of all birds were sounding low and sweet, far, far away. Then she saw a great company of knights and ladies dressed in green, ride up to the castle, and one knight rode apart from the rest on a milk-white steed. They all went into the castle gates, but this knight rode slowly and sadly behind the others, with his head bowed on his breast. Then the musical sounds were still, and the castle and the plain seemed to wave in the water. Next they quite vanished, and the well grew dim, and then grew dark and black and smooth, as it had been before. Still she looked, and the little well bubbled up with sparkling foam, and so became still again, like a mirror, till Jeanie could see her own face in it, and beside her face came the reflection of another face, a young man's dark and sad and beautiful. The lips smiled at her, and then Jeanie knew it was Randall. She thought he must be looking over her shoulder, and she leaped up with a cry and glanced round. But she was all alone, and the wood about her was empty and silent. The light had gone out of the sky, which was pale like silver, and overhead she saw the evening star. Then Jeanie thought all was over. She had seen Randall as if it had been in a glass, and she hardly knew him. He was so much older, and his face was so sad. She sighed and turned to go away over the hills back to Fairney Lee. But her feet did not seem to carry her the way she wanted to go. It seemed as if something within her were moving her in a kind of dream. She felt herself going on through the forest. She did not know where. Deeper into the wood she went, and now it grew so dark that she saw scarce anything. Only she felt the fragrance of briar roses, and it seemed to her that she was guided towards these roses. Then she knew there was a hand in her hand, 
though she saw nobody, and the hand seemed to lead her on, and she came to an open place in the forest, and there the silver light fell clear from the sky, and she saw a great shadowy rose tree covered with white wild roses. The hand was still in her hand, and Jeanie began to wish for nothing so much in the world as to gather some of these roses. She put out her hand, and she plucked one, and there before her stood a strange creature, a dwarf, dressed in yellow and red, with a very angry face. "'Who are you?' he cried, "'that plucked my roses without my will.' "'And who are you?' said Jeanie, trembling. "'And what right have you on the hills of this world?' Then she made the holy sign of the cross, and the face of the elf grew black, and the light went out of the sky. She only saw the faint glimmer of the white flowers, and a kind of shadow standing where the dwarf stood. "'I bid you tell me,' said Jeanie, "'whether you are a Christian man.' or a spirit that dreads the holy sign, and she crossed him again. Now all grew dark as the darkest winter's night. The air was warm and deadly still, and heavy with the scent of the fairy flowers. In the blackness and the silence, Jeanie made this sacred sign for the third time. Then a clear, fresh wind blew on her face, and the forest boughs were shaken, and the silver light grew and gained on the darkness, and she began to see a shape standing where the dwarf had stood. It was far taller than the dwarf, and the light grew and grew, and a star looked down out of the night, and Jean saw Randall standing by her, and she kissed him, and he kissed her, and he put his hand in hers, and they went out of the wood together. They came to the crest of the hill and the cairn. Far below them they saw the tweed shining through an opening among the trees and the lights in the farm of Peel, and they heard the night birds crying and the bells of the sheep ringing musically as they wandered through the fragrant heather of the hills. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Out of Fairyland You may fancy, if you can, what joy there was in Fairney Lee when Randall came home. They quite forgot the hunger and the hard times, and the old nurse laughed and cried over her bairn that had grown into a tall, strong young man, and to Lady Kerr, it was all one as if her husband had come again, as he was when first she knew him long ago. For Randall had his face and his eyes and the very sound of his voice. They could hardly believe he was not a spirit, and they clasped his hands and hung on his neck and could not keep their eyes off him. This was the end of all their sorrow, and it was as if Randall had come back from the dead, so that no people in the world were ever so happy as they were next day, when the sun shone down on the tweed and the green trees that rustle in the wind round Fairney Lee. But in the evening, when the old nurse was out of the way, Randall sat between his mother and Jean, and they each held his hands, as if they could not let him go, for fear he should vanish away from them again, and they would turn round anxiously if anything stirred, for fear it should be the two white deer that sometimes were said to come for people escaped from fairyland, and then these people must rise and follow them, and never return any more. But the white deer never came for Randall, 
So he told them all his adventures and all that had happened to him since that midsummer night, seven long years ago. It had been with him, as it was with Jean. He had gone to the wishing well and wished to see the fairy queen and fairyland, and he had seen the beautiful castle in the well, and a beautiful woman's face had floated up to meet his on the water. Then he had gathered the white roses, and then he heard a great sound of horses' feet and of bells jingling, and a lady rode up, the very lady he had seen in the well. She had a white horse, and she was dressed in green, and she beckoned to Randall to mount on her horse, with her before him on the pillion. And the bells on the bridle rang, and the horse flew faster than the wind. So they rode and rode through the summer night, and they came to a desert place, and living lands were left far behind. Then the fairy queen showed him three paths, one steep and narrow and beset with briars and thorns. That was the road to goodness and happiness. But it was little trodden or marked with the feet of people that had come and gone. And there was the wide, smooth road that went through fields of lilies, and that was the path of easy living and pleasure. The third path wound about the wild hillside through ferns and heather, and that was the way to Elfland. And that way they rode, and still they rode through a country of dark night, and they crossed great black rivers, and they saw neither sun nor moon, but they heard the roaring of the sea. From that country they came into the light and into the beautiful garden that lies round the castle of the fairy queen. There they lived in a noble company of gallant knights and fair ladies. All seemed very mirthful, and they rode and hunted and danced. And it was never dark night nor broad daylight, but like early summer dawn before the sun has risen. There Randall said that he had quite forgotten his mother and Jean, and the world where he was born, and Fairney Lee. But one day he happened to see a beautiful golden bottle of a strange shape, all set with diamonds, and he opened it. There was in it a sweet-smelling water, as clear as crystal, and he poured it into his hand, and passed his hand over his eyes. Now this water had the power to destroy the glamour in fairyland, and make people see it as it really was. And when Randall touched his eyes with it, lo, everything was changed in a moment. He saw that nothing was what it had seemed. The gold vanished from the embroidered curtains. The light grew dim and wretched, like a misty winter day. The fairy queen, that had seemed so happy and beautiful in her bright dress, was a weary pale woman in black, with a melancholy face and melancholy eyes. She looked as if she had been there for thousands of years, always longing for the sunlight and the earth and the wind and rain. There were sleepy poppies twisted in her hair instead of a golden crown, and the knights and ladies were changed. They looked but half alive, and some, in place of their gay green robes, were dressed in rusty mail, pierced with spears and stained with blood, and some were in burial robes of white, and some in dresses torn or dripping with water, or marked with the burning of fire. All were dressed strangely, in some ancient fashion, their weapons were old-fashioned, too, unlike any that Randall had ever seen on earth. 
and their festivals were not of dainty meats, but of cold, tasteless flesh, and of beans and pulse, and such things as the old heathens before the coming of the gospel used to offer to the dead. It was dreadful to see them at such feasts, and dancing and riding and pretending to be merry with hollow faces and unhappy eyes. And Randall wearied of fairyland, which now, that he saw it clearly, looked like a great unending stretch of sand and barren grassy country beside a grey sea where there was no tide. All the woods were of black cypress trees and poplar, and a wind from the sea drove a sea mist through them, white and cold, and it blew through the open courts of the fairy castle. So Randall longed more and more for the old earth he had left, and the changes of summer and autumn, and the streams of Tweed, and the hills, and his friends. Then the voice of Jeanie had come down to him, sounding from far away, and he was sent up by the fairy queen in a fairy form as a hideous dwarf to frighten her away from the white roses in the enchanted forest. But her goodness and her courage had saved him, for he was a christened knight, and not a man of the fairy world, and he had taken his own form again beneath her hand when she signed him with the cross. And here he was, safe and happy, at home at Fairney Lee. End of chapter 10 and chapter 11, The Fairy Bottle We soon grow used to the greatest changes and almost forget the things that we were accustomed to before. In a day or two, Randall had nearly forgotten what a dull life he had lived in fairyland after he had touched his eyes with the strange water in the fairy bottle. He remembered the long gray sands and the cold mist and the white faces of the strange people and the gloomy queen. No more than you remember the dream you dreamed a week ago. But he did notice that Fairney Lee was not the happy place it had been before he went away. Here, too, the faces were pinched and white, and the people looked hungry, and he missed many things that he remembered the silver cups and plates and tankards, and the dinners were not like what they had been, but only a little thin soup and some oatmeal cakes and trout taken from the tweed. The beef and ale of old times were not to be found, even in the houses of the richer people. Very soon Randall heard all about the famine. You may be sure the old nurse was ready to tell him all the saddest stories. Full many a place in evil case, where joy was want afore, O oh, we homes that dwell in leader braes, and Scots that dwell in Yarrow. And the old woman would croon her old prophecies, and tell them how Thomas the Rhymer, that lived in Ursuldown, had foretold all this, and she would wish that they could find these hidden treasures that the rhymes were full of, and that maybe were lying, who knew, quite near them, on their own lands. Where is the gold of Fairney Lee, she would cry, and, oh, Randall, can you no dig for it, and find it, and buy corn out of England for the poor folk? that are dying at your doors? Atween the wet ground and the dry, the gold of Fairney Lee doth lie. There it is, with the sun never glinting on it. There it may bide till the judgment day, and no man the better for it. Between the camp o' rink and tweed water clear lie nine king's ransoms, for nine hundred year. 
I doubt his fairy gold, nurse, said Randall. And would all turn black when it saw the sun. It would just be like this bottle, the only thing I brought with me out of fairyland. Then Randall put his hand in his velvet pouch and brought out a curious little bottle. It was shaped like this, and was made of something that none of them had ever seen before. It was black, and you could see the light through it, and there were green and yellow spots and streaks on it. In bottles like this, the old Romans used to keep their tears for their dead friends. That ugly bottle looked like gold and diamonds when I found it in Fairyland, said Randall. And the water in it smelled as sweet as roses. But when I touched my eyes with it, a drop that ran into my mouth was as salt as the sea, and immediately everything changed. The gold bottle became this glass thing, and the fairies became like folk dead, and the sky grew gray, and all turned waste and ugly. That's the way with fairy gold, nurse, and if you found it, even it would be all dry leaves and black bits of coal before the sun set. Maybe so, and maybe no, said the old nurse. The gold of Fairney Lee may no be fairy gold, but just wealth o' oh, this world that folk buried here lang syne. But no, Randall Mabern, I mun gang out and see my sister's son's doctor that's lying sair sick o' the kinkoff at rink, and take her some of the physic that I gave you and Jean when you were bairns. Kin cough, whooping cough. So the old nurse went out, and Randall and Jean began to be sorry for the child she was going to visit. For they remembered the taste of the physic that the old nurse made by boiling the bark of elder tree branches. And I remember it too, for it was the very nastiest thing that ever was tasted and did nobody any good after all. Then Randall and Jean walked out, strolling along without much noticing where they went, and talking about the pleasant days when they were children. End of Chapter 11 Chapter 12 At the Cat Trail They had climbed up the slope of a hill, and they came to a broad old ditch beneath the shade of a wood of pine trees. Below them was a wide marsh, all yellow with marsh flowers, and above them was a steep slope made of stones. Now the dry ditch where they sat down on the grass, looking towards the tweed with their backs to the hill, was called the Catrail. It ran all through the country, and must have been made by men very long ago. Nobody knows who made it, nor why. They did not know in Randall's time, and they do not know now. They do not even know what the name Catrail means, but that is what it has always been called. The steep slope of stone above them was called the Camp of Rink. It is a round place, like a ring, and no doubt it was built by the old Britons when they fought against the Romans many hundreds of years ago. The stones of which it is built are so large that we cannot tell how men move them, but it is a very pleasant happy place on a warm summer day like the day when Randall and Jean sat there, with the daisies at their feet, and the wild doves cooing above their heads, and the rabbits running in and out among the ferns. Jean and Randall talked about this and that, chiefly of how some money could be got to buy corn and cattle for the people, 
Randall was in favor of crossing the border at night and driving away cattle from the English side according to the usual custom. Every day I expect to see a pair of spurs in a dish for all our dinner, said Randall. That was the sign the lady of the house in the forest used to give her men when all the beef was done and more had to be got by fighting. But Jeanie would not hear of Randall taking Spear and Jack and putting himself in danger by fighting the English. They were her own people, after all. Though she could not remember them, and the days before she was carried out of England by Simon Grieve. Then, said Randall, am I to go back to Fairyland and fetch more gold like this ugly thing? And he felt in his pocket for the fairy bottle. But it was not in his pocket. What have I done with my fairy treasure? cried Randall, jumping up. Then he stood still quite suddenly, as if he saw something strange. He touched Jean on the shoulder, making a sign to her not to speak. Jean rose quietly and looked where Randall pointed. And this was what she saw. She looked over a corner of the old grassy ditch, just where the marsh and the yellow flowers came nearest to it. Here there stood three tall gray stones, each about as high as a man. Between them, with her back to the single stone and between the two others facing Randall and Jean, the old nurse was kneeling. If she had looked up, she could hardly have seen Randall and Jean, for they were within the ditch, and only their eyes were on the level of the rampart. Besides, she did not look up. She was groping in the breast of her dress for something, and her eyes were on the ground. "'What can the old woman be doing?' whispered Randall. "'Why, she has got my fairy bottle in her hand.' Then he remembered how he had shown her the bottle and how she had gone out without giving it back to him. Jean and he watched and kept very quiet. They saw the old nurse still kneeling, take the stopper out of the black strange bottle and turn the open mouth gently on her hand. Then she carefully put in the stopper and rubbed her eyes with the palm of her hand. Then she crawled along in their direction very slowly, as if she were looking for something in the grass. Then she stopped, still looking very closely at the grass. Next, she jumped to her feet with a shrill cry, clapping her hands, and then she turned and was actually running along the edge of the marsh towards Fernie Lee. Nurse, shouted Randall, and she stopped suddenly in a fright, and let the fairy bottle fall. It struck on a stone and broke to pieces with a jingling sound, and a few drops of strange water in it ran away into the grass. Oh, my bairns, my bairns, what have you made me do? cried the old nurse pitifully. The fairy gift is broken, and maybe the gold of Fairney Lee that my eyes have looked on will ne'er be seen again. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 The Gold of Fairney Lee Randall and Jean went to the old woman and comforted her, though they could not understand what she meant. She cried and sobbed and threw her arms about, but by degrees they found out all the story. When Randall had told her how all he saw in Fairyland was changed when he touched his eyes with the water from the bottle, the old woman remembered many tales that she had heard about some charm known to the fairies, which helped them to find things hidden and to see through walls and stones. Then she had got the bottle from Randall and had stolen out, meaning to touch her eyes with the water, and try whether that was the charm, and whether she could find the treasure spoken of in the old rhymes. She went between the camp o' rink and tweed water clear, 
and to the place which lay between the wetland and the dry, that is, between the marsh and the cattrail. Here she had noticed the three great stones which made a kind of chamber on the hillside, and here she had anointed her eyes with the salt water of the bottle of tears. Then she had seen through the grass, she declared, and through the upper soil, and she had beheld great quantities of gold, and she was running with the bottle to tell Randall, and to touch his eyes with the water, that he might see it also. But out of fairyland the strange water only had its magical power, while it was still wet on the eyelashes. This the old nurse soon found for she went back to the three standing stones and looked and saw nothing, only grass and daisies. And the fairy bottle was broken, and all the water spilt. This was her story, and Randall did not know what to believe, but so many strange things had happened to him that one more did not seem impossible. So he and Jean took the old nurse home and made her comfortable in her room, and Jean put her to bed, and got her a little wine and an oat cake. Then Randall very quietly locked the door outside and put the key in his pocket. It would have been of no use to tell the old nurse to be quiet about what she thought she had seen. By this time it was late and growing dark. But that night there would be a moon. After supper, of which there was very little, Lady Kerr went to bed, but Randall and Jean slipped out into the moonlight. They took a sack with them, and Randall carried a pickaxe and a spade. They walked quickly to the three great stones, and waited for a while to hear if all was quiet. Then Jean threw a white cloak round her, and stole about the edges of the camp and the wood, she knew that if any wandering man came by, he would not stay long where such a figure was walking. The night was cool, the dew lay on the deep fern, there was a sweet smell from the grass and from the pine wood. In the meantime, Randall was digging a long trench with his pickaxe, above the place where the old woman had knelt, as far as he could remember it. He worked very hard and when he was in the trench up to his knees, his pickaxe struck against a stone. He dug round it with the spade and came to a layer of black burnt ashes of bones. Beneath these, which he scraped away, was a large flat stone on which his pick had struck. It was a wide slab of red sandstone, and Randall soon saw that it was the lid of a great stone coffin such as the plowshare sometimes strikes against when men are plowing the fields in the border country. Randall had seen these before when he was a boy, and he knew that there was never much in them except ashes and one or two rough pots of burnt clay. He was very disappointed. It had seemed as if he was really coming to something, and behold, it was only an old stone coffin. However, he worked on till he had cleared the whole of the stone coffin lid. It was a very large stone chest, and must have been made, Randall thought, for the body of a very big man. With the point of his pickaxe he raised the lid. In the moonlight he saw something of a strange shape. He put down his hand and pulled it out. It was an image in metal about a foot high, and represented a beautiful woman with wings on her shoulders, sitting on a wheel. Randall had never seen an image like this, but in an old book which belonged to the monks of Melrose, he had seen, when he was a boy, a picture of such a woman. The monks had told him that she was fortune, with her swift wings that carry her from one person to another as luck changes and with her wheel that she turns with the turning of chance in the world. The image was very heavy. Randall rubbed some of the dirt and red clay off and 
found that the metal was yellow. He cut it with his knife. It was soft. He cleaned a piece, which shone bright and unrusted in the moonlight, and touched it with his tongue. Then he had no doubt any more. The image was gold. Randall knew now that the old nurse had not been mistaken. With the help of the fairy water, she had seen the gold of Fairney Lee. He called very softly to Jeanie, who came glimmering in her white robes through the wood, looking herself like a fairy. He put the image in her hand and set his finger on his lips to show that she must not speak. Then he went back to the great stone coffin and began to grope in it with his hands. There was much earth in it that had slowly sifted through during the many years that it had been buried, but there was also a great round bowl of metal and a square box. Randall got out the bowl first. It was covered with a green rust and had a lid. In short, it was a large ancient kettle such as soldiers use in camp. Randall got the lid off, and behold, it was all full of very ancient gold coins. Not Greek, nor Roman, but like such in use in Britain before Julius Caesar came. The box was of iron. On the lid in the moonshine, Jeanie could read the letters S-P-Q-R, but she did not know what they meant. The box had been locked and chained and clamped with iron bars. But all was so rusty that the bars were easily broken and the lid torn off. Then the moon shone on bars of gold and on great plates and dishes of gold and silver marked with letters, and with what Randall thought were crests. Many of the cups were studded with red and green and blue stones, and there were beautiful plates and dishes, purple, gold, and green, and one of these fell and broke into a thousand pieces, for it was of some strange kind of glass. There were three gold sword hilts, carved wonderfully into the figures of strange beasts, with wings and heads like lions. Randall and Jean looked at it and marveled, and Jean sang in a low, sweet voice. Between the camp o' rink and tweed water clear lie nine kings' ransoms for nine hundred year. Nobody ever saw so much treasure in all broad Scotland. Jean and Randall passed the rest of the night in hiding what they had found. Heart they hid in the secret chamber of Fairney Lee, of which only Jean and Lady Kerr and Randall knew the secret. The rest they stowed away in various places. Then Randall filled the earth into the trench and cast wood on the place and set fire to the wood so that the next day there was nothing there but ashes and charred earth. You will not need to be told what Randall did, now that he had treasure in plenty. Some he sold to France to the king, Henry the Second, and some in Rome to the Pope. And with the money which they gave him, he bought corn and cattle in England, enough to feed all his neighbors, and stock the farms, and sow the fields for next year. And Fairney Lee became a very rich and fortunate house, for Randall married Jean, and soon their children were playing on the banks of the Tweed and rolling down the grassy slope to the river to bathe on hot days. And the old nurse lived long and happy among her new bairns, and often she told them how it was she that really found the gold of Fairney Lee. You may wonder what the gold was, and how it came there. Probably Father Francis, the good Melrose monk, was right. He said that the iron box and the gold image of fortune and the kettle full of coins had belonged to some regiment of the Roman army. The kettle and the coins they must have taken from the Britons, 
the box and all the plate were their own and brought from italy then they in their turn must have been defeated by some of the fierce tribes beyond the roman wall and must have lost all their treasure that must have been buried by the victorious enemy and they again must have been driven from the strong camp at rink either by some foes from the north or by a new roman army from the south so all the gold lay at fernilee for many hundred years never quite forgotten as the old rhyme showed but never found till it was discovered in their sore need by the old nurse and randall and jean as for randall and jean they lived to be old and died on one day and they were buried at dryburg in one tomb and a green tree grows over them and the tweed goes murmuring past their grave and past the grave of sir walter scott the end end of the gold of fairney lee by andrew lang